such a good song. Um, if we think about the relationship we have with Christ, it's, it should be so overwhelming to us that we get to have that, have that relationship with Christ. I, re I really do love that song. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, then as she was singing, I'm thinking, what kind of, how do you segue from that song into what I'm going to talk about um, to start my sermon out? So I figured this is the best segue I can give. You ever had a Klondike bar? Flawless segue, wasn't it? You know how we just went from that beautiful song to now everybody's thinking of a Klondike bar. I just ruined everything. A Klondike bar, if uh, hopefully everybody knows what that is, the little square ice cream bar with dipped in chocolate and don't leave, I'm just talking about it, not don't crave that. But it's dipped in chocolate and it's delicious. They've got different flavors. You got heath and peppermint and I don't know what else they have, but it's, they're good. It doesn't matter which one you get. It's life changing. They are very good ice cream bars. In the 1980s, there were a series of Klondike bar commercials that came out and they asked one question. That's all they asked. They asked the one question. Anybody know what the question was? What would you do for a Klondike bar? That's the only question they had to ask. What would you do for a Klondike bar? And throughout those commercials, watching those commercials, you saw that people did some crazy things for a Klondike bar. They walk up to people on the street and say, hey, in front of all these people here, would you cluck like a chicken and flap your wings? And if you do, I'll give you this Klondike bar. And people would stand there in public just flapping their wings and clucking like a chicken. Like, well, good for you, sir. You get an ice cream for that. And some people, they, I even watched one commercial where they take knives and they said, if you'll stand by this wall, this professional knife thrower is just going to throw these knives at you. But if you do, you're going to get a Klondike bar. And the person just stands next to the wall. They don't know this guy. They don't know if he's really professional or not. They just know there's ice cream in this for me. And they stand next to, the, <laughs> they stand next to this wall and they get these knives thrown at them. But the reward is great because they get this chocolatey coated ice cream bar and it's just worth it. And I'm telling you, those, that advertisement, that, that slogan that they put out there, it worked. It really worked because it's 2019 and everyone knows what was the one question? What would you do for a Klondike bar? We all know the slogan. It worked. Not only that, but companies started fighting against each other. Like they wanted to own this Klondike bar because it was doing so well. So even in the real world, people were doing a lot of things for the Klondike bar. They really wanted this thing. Everybody has a limit to what they will or will not do for something. There is, there is a stopping point. There's things I will not do for a Klondike bar. I will purchase one. That is something I will do for a Klondike bar. But a lot of the other things that was asked, uh, I'm probably not going to do that. I don't know who you are throwing knives at me, but I may not get a Klondike bar out of this deal. And that's not worth the risk. <laughs> So there are certain things I'm not going to do. But there, everybody's got that stopping point. They've got that limit of things that they, I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it. And everybody knows, you know where that line is that you've drawn. I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. I want to talk about a guy today that really didn't seem to have this problem. He didn't, he didn't know the meaning of the word quit. It, there's, there is like nothing he wouldn't do. The Apostle Paul is this man. The, the guy just didn't know how to give up. He didn't know how to stop. He's nearing the end of his ministry and he's been in Ephesus for quite some time now. And he's preparing to follow God's leading to go to Jerusalem. And by the way, the picture that is on the screen this morning um, is a pretty intense picture. And I, and, and I want everybody to remember this picture. Um, because anytime you think about this sermon, I want you to remember what's going on in this picture. And I'm going to explain it as we go through it. But so much, there's so much going on here. And stay with me. It's all going to make sense by the time we get to the end of this. Paul is heading to Jerusalem. God is leading him to go to Jerusalem. Let's look at Acts chapter 19 and verse 21. It says, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, catch that, in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia to go to Jerusalem saying after I have been there I must also see Rome. I would like to take a minute to tell you why 
Jerusalem wasn't the most strategic place for Paul to go. This wasn't a good idea. Before Paul was saved, Jerusalem was the place where he took Christians to be punished or killed. Paul's name was Saul. He was Saul of Tarsus before his name was changed to Paul. And Jerusalem's where he took these Christians to be punished or to be killed. Jerusalem is where Paul watched Stephen get martyred because of the fact that he was preaching Jesus Christ. And they stoned Stephen to death and Paul was there when that happened. Paul had many friends and religious cohorts who agreed that the Christian population should be completely wiped out. That's where his old, that's where his old friends were, is in Jerusalem. And they agreed that Christianity needs to be wiped out because people are saying that Jesus is the Messiah and they did not want to agree to the fact that Jesus was the true Son of God. So they wanted Christianity wiped out. Now Paul is saved. On the road to Damascus, Paul ends up getting saved and now he is one of those Christians. And by accepting Christ as his personal Savior, he has betrayed all of his former religious partners who were still in Jerusalem. They're still there and he has betrayed every one of them. Jerusalem is one of the most dangerous places Paul could possibly go. You don't, as Paul the Apostle, you don't want to go to Jerusalem. Now that's why Jerusalem is a bad move. That's why it's not strategically sound. You don't want to go to Jerusalem. But let me tell you why it was a good move. God was leading Paul to go to Jerusalem. That is why it's a good move. By the way, if God's ever leading you to do something or you feel that God is calling you towards uh, one decision or another, it's good to follow. Even if it's a hard decision to make, you follow God. And that's why strategically, this was a brilliant move to go to Jerusalem. Paul ends up preaching an incredible message to the people at Ephesus before he leaves. And this is the picture of his farewell in Acts chapter 20 and verse 36. It says, And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Paul is most likely going to be killed and they know it. They know they're never going to see their friend again. He's, he's going to Jerusalem and they know what he's going to run into there. And they say goodbye to Paul knowing that this is the last chapter of their friendship with Paul. Now Paul is sailing to Jerusalem and his story becomes really interesting. I love it when God gets involved in ways that seem like God is going against his own will because there's so much we can learn. Anytime you see a possible contradiction in the Bible, it, by the way, it's not even possible that there's a contradiction in the Bible, but whenever you run into one, there's a lot to be learned there. Paul is sailing to Jerusalem, and on his way there, the, the ship is to, it has to stop in the city of Tyre. And in Tyre, Paul ends up meeting some other followers of Christ, and they have a message for him. And I want you to, I've highlighted the words that I want you to notice here, but look at uh, Acts chapter 21 and verse 4. In finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, who told Paul to go to Jerusalem? God told Paul to go to Jerusalem. Through the Spirit, he tells Paul, I want you to go to Jerusalem. Now this group of people come up to Paul and it says they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Here's where the journey seems to get a little complicated. It says that they told Paul through the Spirit. They're not just saying it. It says that God's involved with this message. Don't go. But didn't God already tell Paul to go? Yes. Yes, Paul's supposed to go. God has placed a tremendous burden on the hearts of these disciples and they have to inform Paul about the risk. Don't go, Paul. If you go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you because you're Paul. You are, you're not supposed to be a Christian and you are. And if you go to Jerusalem, that's going to be the end. Paul, you can't go to Jerusalem. But in Acts chapter 19, we saw that Paul had purposed in the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. God was involved in his decision to go to Jerusalem. 
Paul is going to Jerusalem because God was leading him to go, and now God is leading other people to tell him not to go. Well, that'll mess with your head a little bit. That, that'll, that'll trip you up. But Paul decides to continue on his trip to Jerusalem anyway. They're telling him, you cannot go. Do not go to Jerusalem. And Paul says, hey, I have to go to Jerusalem. So here comes another farewell. Let's look at Acts chapter 21 and verse 5. It says, when, when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. God has led these people to open their hearts to Paul and encourage him not to go. But Paul had to obey what God told him to do. Paul knows that God told him to go, so he's going to obey. And that's when God steps in and makes a decision even more difficult. God's good at what God does. And his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So when he starts messing with us, enjoy the ride. Because he, you're about to learn something. You're about to grow in an area where you have not been able to grow before. And God's going to take you to a new height in your life. So hang on. God steps in and complicates things a little bit more here. The ship ends up stopping once again, but this time it stops in a place called Caesarea. Here Paul runs into an old friend, and this man is a prophet and has been proven to be used by God in the past. His name is Agabus. And the first time we see him mentioned in Scripture is in Acts chapter 11. The Christians who were in Judea were in need of help in the church in Antioch wanted to send relief to those Christians. Let's look at Acts chapter 11, verse 28. It says, Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit that there, were, there, there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, which according to his ability, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Not only has Paul seen the prophecies of Agabus, he's also been sent out by him to go help other Christians. Agabus has a good reputation. He is a true man of God. He's a prophet of God. And if he says that the message is from God, you're going to be able to count on the fact that it was from God. Agabus is a good man. So let's look at what happens when Paul stops in Caesarea. Acts chapter 21 and verse 10. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith, or thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. The disciples that we saw earlier in Tyre, where the ship stopped first, all were begging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Please don't go. And Paul says, I've got to go. So they say goodbye to him there. Now the people in Caesarea are begging him not to go. Uh, come on, there's got to be a red flag here somewhere, Paul. Don't go. Don't go to Jerusalem. And on top of that, God sends a prophet with a warning of what will happen if he does go. Using his own belt as an object lesson. Give me your belt, Paul. The one who owns this belt is going to be bound if he goes to Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen. They're going to not only bind you, but they're going to turn you over to the Gentiles. You're going to go to Rome and they're going to kill you. That's, that's the story, Paul. This also influences Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, and those traveling with Paul to try to stop him from going also. Don't go to Jerusalem. There's a lot of people in this story saying, Paul, don't go. Don't go to Jerusalem. 
God has put it in the hearts of a lot of people to encourage Paul to just stay where you're at. If you continue to go to Jerusalem, this is goodbye forever. We, they're going to kill you. But I want to point out one person who never told Paul not to go. God never told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Now, he encouraged other people to tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem. He tells Agabus, you know, do an object lesson for Paul. Let him know if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound. They're going to deliver you over to Rome. That's where he's going to die. Let Paul know. But God is the one who told Paul to go in the first place, and Paul says, I have to go. Because God told me personally, I need to go to Jerusalem. And then God sends a bunch of people almost to discourage Paul from going. He brought people into Paul's path in order to warn him. But all this did was ignite the fire of the lives who witnessed Paul not backing down. Why won't you stop, Paul? Because God told me to go. But God told us that you're going to die if you go. But God told me to go. They're going to hurt you, Paul. Don't go. He, yeah, I know what you're saying, but God told me to go. When Paul heard the warning of Agabus, he knew what was going to happen to him if he went. Yeah, Agabus, he's a prophet. He... He knows. And he made it personal. He used my belt. It's going to happen to me. <laughs> it's not just uh, something that's about to happen. No, this is what's going to happen to you personally if you go. Look at how Paul responds in verse 13 of Acts 21. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, the will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Paul made it evident to everyone who was there that he understood the risk. But he also understood God's will. I see what's going to happen. I get it. I, I know. I'm probably going to die. But I also know God's will. And when it says, when they saw that he would not be persuaded, they said this, the will of the Lord be done. It was always th God's will to send Paul to Jerusalem. Paul was supposed to go to Jerusalem. But there were other Christians who needed to see who God had transformed Paul into. You need to see what he's going to do. Discourage him. Everybody go. Discourage him not to go. But he's going to listen to me. He's going to listen to what I told him to do. Everybody's discouraging Paul. Paul says, I can't, I can't stop. I've got to keep going. He doesn't see, he, it doesn't seem like he understands what they're talking about. Don't go, they will kill you. Isn't that bad? It's, yeah, that's pretty bad. I'm going to go check that out. Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm going to go. Why would you go after hearing that warning? Because he knew what God told him to do. What anyone else would have seen as a warning, Paul saw as confirmation. That's a pretty strong faith right there. Yeah, everybody else is saying, hey, God said if you go, they're going to do this to you. Yeah, that's confirmation. I need to go. It almost seems backwards, but it's not. You see, this wasn't the first time that Paul had been introduced to this idea of imprisonment and death. Let's look back one chapter at Acts chapter 20 and verse 22 says, and see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things will move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God." says, yeah, God keeps telling me. He testifies in every city. Every, everywhere I go, He testifies that chains and tribulations await me. But I'm going to go. I'm going to finish my race. I'm going to run this race. You see, Paul got a whole, the whole picture. He saw the reality of who God was and the magnitude of what God's grace really was. Paul got it. 
he really got it. And I, my prayer is that one day I'll get it to that level. I will understand that. And my prayer is that you will too. Do we get it? Do, he got it. He seemed to understand everything going on here. He didn't just know about Jesus. He was convinced of Jesus. It wasn't just a salvation experience. No, he was convinced of Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. By the way, do we understand this? It doesn't say that he knows the way. It doesn't say that his teachings are the way. The way is a person. Jesus Christ is the way. Paul is convinced of Jesus Christ. I don't just know about him. I didn't just meet him. I don't just have a relationship with him. I am convinced he is the answer. The world needs him. He is the way. He understood that there was going to be a lot of pain and that he was most likely going to be killed. But his perspective on the matter was very unique. Look at 2 Corinthians. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul considered any persecution, look at what he calls it, light affliction. Light affliction. And he understood that it was only going to be for a moment in comparison to eternity. Uh, this is just a light affliction. Didn't you have the, the flesh taken off your back? Yes. Weren't you stoned and left for dead? Yes. Did you say light affliction? Yeah. And it's only but for a moment. It's just a light affliction. What I'm going through right now, it's, it's okay. It's just for a moment in time. It's a light affliction. Paul knew what God had done in his life. And he wasn't going to allow anything to overshadow that. Because Paul really got it. A lot of Christians today, what we do is we get saved and we're thankful for our salvation. We are so grateful that Jesus did everything for us, but we don't really understand the magnitude of what that took and the depths of what that means. Paul got it. And when it came down to the suffering that he endured, it was no comparison to the grace that he received through Jesus' life. Romans 8, 18. Paul said this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul compared God to everything else. And many people today often compare everything else to God. Let me explain what I mean there. If the circumstance is good, then God is good. If the circumstance is bad, then God is bad. If the circumstance is bad, then God must be punishing me for something I did, which is unbiblical. But we often compare everything else to God. Paul thought this circumstance is what the circumstance is, but it's got nothing on God. It was a totally different way of thinking. Yeah, this is rough, but you, it's no comparison to the grace of God. My God is sufficient. He's everything to me. And even though I'm suffering, even though I'm going through this rough circumstance, and it's got nothing on my God. God is incredible. When you look at how the apostles lived and died, it almost seems like they really didn't get it. Did they not understand the pain that they were going to face? Did these guys just not get it? Some, were, some of these guys were boiled alive in oil. And I'm not trying to be graphic here. It's just, it's history. And I think, I think we should get, it's healthy to at least open our minds to what the people that got this Bible into our hands what they went through. I think it would be good. I think it's healthy for us to open our minds to that. Some of these people, people were boiled alive in oil. Some were beheaded. Some were crucified. 
oftentimes the flesh was torn from their backs and they were stoned and le left for dead. They actually did that. Christians have been burned at the stake and some of them have even been skinned alive. Why? Why do they just not understand what that's going to feel like? Why? And for what? Why would they do it? These people were often tortured to make them stop preaching that Jesus is the answer to death and hell. Just stop telling people that Jesus is the way. Stop. And we won't do this to you. But look at what they did after they were tortured. Here's an example in Acts chapter 5 and verse 40. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. What's wrong with these guys? What in the world possesses you to do this? Why didn't the pain cause them to stop? Stop telling people that Jesus is the way. No. Then they beat these guys and they release them. And what's it say they do? They go to the next house. I need to tell you about Jesus. What happened to you? Well, they beat me because I was going to tell you about Jesus. You know they're going to do it again? Yeah, so I need to hurry and tell you about Jesus. Do you not get it? What's, what in the world's going through their minds? It's not that the fact that they knew Jesus. It's the fact they were convinced of Jesus. He is the way. You can believe anything else you want and you can be completely sold out to it. But if you miss this truth, you miss it all. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody is getting to heaven but by Him. He is the way. Their suffering revealed that their treasure was in Christ, not in the things of this world. These people were alive in Christ. They were actually alive in Him. They lived as if he was the only hope that the world could be saved. Because Jesus Christ is the only hope that the world could be saved. And they knew it. And it was worth, it was worth everything they were going through. Because people had to know. They had to know. They received the message of Jesus Christ and they heard it loud and clear. And it wasn't just that they could be saved from hell. No, they really got it. It wasn't just the fact that you could be saved. No, it, go, it went deeper than that. They really, really got it. In the past week, I've heard a lot of people say that they really like the sermon series that we just got done with about being free in Christ. Really liked that sermon series and it was liberating and they, and they liked how the Bible opens up and shows us who we are in Christ. But they're having a difficult time making it personal. And I want to point out one very important truth to you. It becomes personal. It can become very personal in your life and in my life. And when it becomes personal, you will understand why these people were so willing to even lay down their lives for Christ if that's what was required. When that truth becomes personal, you're going to get it. You're going to understand why they were willing to do what they did why did they do it? They were convinced of him. So I'm going to try to reiterate what I said in that sermon series. And I will keep preaching it until we truly understand the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And are able to move forward as children of God. When we were born, we were born into sin. There wasn't ever going to be anything we could do to earn God's grace. Lock that in. You were born into sin and there was nothing you were ever going to be able to do to earn God's grace. 
you're out. From the very beginning, you are out. Our best efforts were always going to fall short of the relationship that God deserved. Always. You're out. Sin was inevitable. That means God knew what he was going, it was going to cost himself in order to have a relationship with you. Do we understand that? Sin was going to happen. God knew sin was going to happen. So he also knew what it was going to require him to do in order to have a relationship with you. And he did it anyway. Do we get this? When you were created, he knew there was no chance of having a relationship with you unless he suffered in your place. Unless he traded positions with you, you were never getting to God. He knew the pain he was going to have to go through on the cross. He knew the separation from his father that he was going to have to experience. He knew the pain, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He understood the pain of that picture for every person that ever lived for all of time. He understood that. And he says, I'm in. I'll do it anyway. I'll do it anyway. Do we get it? 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 20 it says, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Before it all began, Jesus volunteered to do whatever it took to actively love you. Do we get it? I'm going to love them. Uh, you already love them. I'm going to actively love them. I'm going to stand in the gap for them. I'm going to take their place. Why? Do we get it? It's not just the fact that there's a story in the Bible of Jesus dying on the cross and rising again. No, He actively loves you. He did that for you. That was a real event. He really did it for you. You may be thinking, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You just don't know what I've done. God knows. God knows what you did, and that's why He came to free you from it. He even knew that and he said it's worth it. It's worth it because there's a chance they might be saved if they'll just understand that I am the way. He died on the cross so you didn't have to. He experienced the full wrath of God on himself to save you from, from what was already heading your way. The wrath of God was coming towards you because we were in sin. A preacher once describe this describes it this way it's as if we were standing only a few hundred yards away from a dam of water 10,000 miles high and 10,000 miles wide all of a sudden that dam burst open and a torrential flood of water came crashing towards us and we had no way to get out of its path Right before it reached our feet, the ground in front of us opens up and swallows it all. Do we get it? The wrath of God was supposed to flood over us. And right before it hit me, the ground opens up and swallows all of that wrath. Jesus Christ drank every drop from the cup of God's wrath. Every drop. And he did it for you. And he did it for me. Do we get it? Do we really get it? What should have ended me was used to deliver me. <laughs> That's deep. That is huge. It's not just the fact that he wanted to save me. Look what he did for me. Jesus was in love with you far before you ever sinned and he always loved you in spite of your sins. And he still loves you. He freed you from the bondage of sin that you would no longer walk in them. Don't do that anymore. I have freed you from that. 
Why was Paul so willing to go to Jerusalem even when he knew it would cost him his life? He committed sins. He even killed Christians and persecuted the church. How could he serve Christ knowing about the things that he had done? How could he move forward in freedom knowing what he had done in the past? How could you do this, Paul? Well, he tells us in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize. What prize? The prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. At salvation, he received a call upon his life. Paul understood that the outpouring of God's wrath should have crushed him. But Jesus took it all. The things that Paul had done in the past were no longer going to be his focus. That was then, and this is now. The sins that Christ died to remove were no longer going to consume his thoughts, but instead he was going to focus on whatever Christ wanted to accomplish with his life. Paul was more satisfied to count everything lost just to be able to live for Christ. You see, Paul was actually satisfied in Christ. I'm happy with this. Look at Philippians 4 and verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul's past was not his focus. Paul's current circumstances were not his focus. Jesus Christ was Paul's focus. Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I want my life to be something that will bring the most glory to God. I, I want that. Personally, I want to live my life in a way that brings the most glory to God. And I'm sure many of you do too. But how do we do that? And here's the answer. God is the most glorified in us when we are the most satisfied in Him. Remember this. He is the most glorified in us when we are the most satisfied in Him. He's enough. He's everything. I can, be in, I can be content through whatever I'm going through. Why? Because I'm looking at Him. I'm looking at Him. I'm focused on... I'm satisfied in Christ. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I really got overpaid. I really got overpaid when I got saved. I was the sinner, and now I'm the child of God. I was the reason for His pain. And I was made the recipient of his life. I really got overpaid here. He was broken and I was healed. He was rejected and I was accepted. Man, I got way too much. Way overpaid. He drank every drop of the wrath of God that was meant for me. And he paid an incredible price to redeem me. And I want to make sure he's getting his money's worth. I want Him to be glorified in my life. But I need to be satisfied in His life. Paul understood that there was no amount of suffering and no amount of his past actions that could even be compared to the amount of undeserved grace he received at salvation. It's not even close. It's not even close. Let's look at what he said one more time. In Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's not even a comparison. You having a bad day? Yes. Are you overwhelmed? I can't be. Why? Because I'm overwhelmed with something else. What's that? He loved me. I can't get over the fact that He loves me. That he would die for me. 
that the wrath of God which was coming in as a flood was swallowed up by Jesus Christ so it didn't have to touch me when I was deserving of that and he was undeserving of that. I, don't, I can't get over the fact that he loves me. So the circumstances aren't overwhelming you? No, he is overwhelming me. That is mind-blowing. He was rejected so I could be accepted. He was hurt and I was set free. I was the one guilty and he was the one innocent and he paid the price so I didn't have to. Yeah, my day can't get bad. I can't have a bad day because I have Jesus Christ and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do we get it? Do we really get it? Jesus fought and I win. He died and I live. He became sin for us that we may be become the righteousness of God in him. Do we get that? Do we get it? If the freedom which was provided by Jesus Christ is not flowing from your life, it is either not there or it is being hindered by something that should not be there. If you are not living free in Christ, understand what's going on here. It's either you don't have that freedom in Christ. You don't, he has not saved you. You've never accepted Him as your personal Savior. Or it is being hindered by something that should not be there. Maybe you're focused on your past. Maybe you're thinking, man, I've done too many things. God can't use me. He died for those. He threw those as far as east is from west. Now He's in you and you're in Him. And he wants to do something. He wants to live in you. Yeah, you're, you're in. Don't let that hinder you from letting Christ live through you. It's time for the world to see the children of God living like the children of God. You are free. You really are free. And it is liberating. It's an amazing story. Paul knew that he could advertise Christ while he was both going through the good times and through the sufferings. I get to advance the cause of Christ either way. Paul understood that Jesus must have really wanted to do something with him if he was willing to go through such extreme lengths to save him. He really did get it. To live for Christ is a privilege that we don't deserve. But he does deserve it. Let him live through you. He deserves that. He deserves much more than that, but he does deserve that. Why would, we, why would we hinder that from happening? Why would we involve ourselves in anything other than letting Christ live through us? And I'm so thankful for what he did for me. But I'm not just going to say thank you, I'm going to live it. And I hope that's your prayer too. Again, I'm not just going to stop and say thanks. I'm going to live a thankful life. Thank you. Because that should hit me. And it, you took it all on yourself. My prayer is that every child of God will see their new life for what it really is. He died, you live. He was rejected, you are accepted. You were unworthy and he is still worthy. He took on the wrath of God and you missed out on it. He did the work so you could find rest. Do we get it? Do we understand what this is all about? He deserves our all. But He will never really, truly have our all until we get it. We, we need to understand this. Do we get it? He will be the most glorified in me when I am the most satisfied in Him. Understand the picture of what happened for you. It wasn't just a book a picture book of Jesus dying on the cross and rising. That's not all it was. So much went into this to actively love you as a person. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, would you let him love you, actively love you today? If you've got doubts, I don't even know if I'd make it to heaven if I died right now. Well, I know a guy and he can save you so you can know that you're going to heaven when you die because he truly 
is the way. But if you're in here this morning and you say, I, I want that freedom in Christ, but there's things holding me back from letting him just live freely through me, because I keep thinking about the sins, the actions that I've done in the past, and I just can't see myself as a free child of God, then this would be a good day to come up and say, God, you've already taken my sins. Help me walk away from them. You've already done everything for me. You've got an open door here, and I need to make sure it remains open so you can live your life through me to reach other people. I want to be free, even in my mind. I want to be free. Today, let's understand who we are, and let's take care of that this morning. But God will never truly have your all until we get it. Stand with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the...